This video brought to you in part by Super Hazard Quest. You know, one of the best parts of retro games is being able to play on the couch with your friends. But what if I told you that one of the latest side-scrolling indie titles can be played anywhere with no electricity required? Super Hazard Quest is a tabletop game designed to look and play like a retro side-scroller. Now, when I first saw this game, I was impressed with its really clever design. Players choose from eight unique heroes and navigate through randomly generated dungeons in search of the game's final boss, the Scrambler. The first hero to defeat the Scrambler takes all the glory, and with up to 8-way multiplayer and PvP combat, your worst enemies will likely be the other heroes. And I can say this from personal experience, Grace teleported the final boss away from me the last second, stole all the glory. I also appreciate that it all fits into a small box so it's easy to lug around to a party. You can pick up the base game on Amazon now, and if you use the promo code SSFF2019, you'll save 15%. Link is in the description below. Go from the couch to the table, unplug and play Super Hazard Quest, the first and as of now only completely analog multiplayer side scroller. Again, that code is SSFF2019. The link is in the description below. Thanks to Super Hazard Quest for sponsoring the video. Now, on to the video. You ever see a game that reminds you of a simpler time? For me, it's Mortal Kombat 11. On the Switch. You're a dead ringer for your mother. I'll kick your ass on her behalf, Cabal. How long has it been since we've seen a port? This compromised. Campaign cutscenes are pre-rendered movies and then take a huge dump when the real models show up. And the crypt! Wow, the crypt has got to be one of the worst looking and worst running things ever released by a major big budget game ever. And if I'm wrong about that, like leave a comment and let me know. I would love to see something worse than this because woof, I ain't seen fog that bad since Turok 1. It even has an extremely major flaw. Many of the game's modes, like the story mode, the towers, the crypt, hell, even the tutorial, can't be played without an internet connection. Requiring a portable game to be this online makes this port almost completely unnecessary, and that's why it's perfect punch away material. You know I love this kind of stuff. Though don't get me wrong, series elder god Ed Boon promised we'd get 60 FPS on the Switch. Is the Switch version gonna run at 30? No, the Switch version is going to run at 60. And he delivered. Now, I'm no MK11 expert by any any stretch at all, but it seems to play about as good as the PS4 version. Altogether, the Switch port is still at least a competent port of a Mortal Kombat game, which you could not say about the locust swarm of Mortal Kombat games that have been released upon portable systems since the series first uppercutted onto consoles in 1993. This is Punching Weight, where we celebrate the weird, ambitious, and unnecessary, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about every portable Mortal Kombat port, but the most ambitious portable Mortal Kombat ports. So it stops skeletons from fighting. The, skele the skeletons are fighting this time, but it's okay. It's a consensual pugilist tournament fight. It's a, fun, it's a fun fight. They're already dead, so they can't... Fatalities are fine. They're just gonna put themselves back together. Why don't we call this set the crypt? Because there's not enough fog. Punching Weight doesn't spend enough time talking about Tiger Electronic games. And you know what? Shame on me, because they are arguably the most unnecessary video game thing ever. But I love them. You just gotta appreciate the moxie of trying to port so many varied franchises to an LCD system. However, to be frank, there are too many Mortal Kombat games released on Tiger Electronics, and we're not gonna get into all of them. But I got a few favorites. Mortal Kombat 1 got a port, because of course it did. And then I got re-released with bar cards, which is like its own thing. Bar cards are basically how Tiger Electronics did cheat codes. Each system came with multiple cards that would buff you up, let you skip fights, or make your enemies stronger. MK2 never got any Tiger Electronic love, but they made up for it with multiple versions of MK3. One version was for the R Zone, which was an LCD-based competitor to Nintendo's Virtual Boy, if that gives you any idea of how successful it was. They're right in my face! But really, the game that takes the cake is Mortal Kombat Trilogy, for the Gamecom. This is Tiger Electronics really going for it, leaving their LCD roots behind them and attempting something resembling actual video games. And it plays more games than you idiots have brain cells! Released just a year before the Game Boy Color, the Gamecom was the first console with a touchscreen and the first portable system with online connectivity in 1997. But it was also black and white with games averaging about 16 megabits. 
Tiger Electronics used the licensing connections they had built up over the last decade to release a surprising number of ports from big name franchises like Duke Nukem, Resident Evil 2, Fighters Mega Mix, and of course Mortal Kombat Trilogy, one of the most ambitious ports of Mortal Kombat ever. It is a severely compromised port, but there's still an impressive amount of content here. 13 characters, 10 stages, and each character has one fatality, one brutality, one babality, and one friendship. You usually don't see that many finishers in portable Mortal Kombat, but in terms of how it plays, it's just a glorious grease fire. It's slow and stiff, animations are jittery, the game almost breaks if two people jump kick at the same time, the enemy AI is super intense, oh, and I love this, the game has no music, but you can still sample all 10 of its sound effects in the options menu. It's hilarious that specifically Mortal Kombat Trilogy was on the Gamecom because if Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 was like Mortal Kombat 3 2, the Mortal Kombat Trilogy is Mortal Kombat 3 3. The PlayStation version had a massive roster of 36 playable characters. The Gamecom has 13, which is actually the most playable characters of any Tiger Electronics Mortal Kombat game. So there's that. But in terms of sheer graphical might, it's not even the best looking fighting game on the Gamecom. Just look at how Fighters Mega Mix struggles to emulate 3D stages. Oh, gorgeous. But Tiger Electronics wished they ruled over the dominion of terrible portable MK games. But no, that dubious crown still belongs to Nintendo. Thanks to the Game Boy's dominance in the handheld market and Acclaim's willingness to put Mortal Kombat on any system, quality be damned, there's just a glut of awful Game Boy ports packed to the brim with terrible too hard AI, poor animations, and bad controls. Like they even bundled MK1 and 2 for the Game Boy together and re-released them. Can you imagine the sheer cojones you'd need to take two of the worst ports ever and sell them in a bundle? This right here almost takes home the goal, but really, the best of the bunch is Mortal Kombat 4 for the Game Boy Color. you think that by the time of the Game Boy Color and after three Game Boy ports, they'd have had this figured out, but nope. Tiger almost out terribled them with Trilogy on the Gamecom, but they retaliated with MK4 on the Game Boy Color. The ambition is only matched by how gloriously awful it is. Mortal Kombat 4 already marked a troubled era for the franchise. After a few years of iterating on Mortal Kombat 3, Midway was ready to experiment with platformers, action games, and the third dimension. Let's just say these efforts were met with mixed results. So in a lot of ways, porting Mortal Kombat 4 to the Game Boy Color was already a bad idea. But this little port gives it its all. It has digitized voice samples and fatality cutscenes. Yes, cutscenes on a Game Boy Color. Hey, this video might get demonetized by YouTube because of this footage. That's gotta count for something. Okay, probably won't, but a guy can dream, can he? This port was made by Digital Eclipse, who would go on to make the fantastic port of Dragon's Lair for the Game Boy Color. They bring that digitized magic here, except it comes at the cost of everything else in the game? Because really, it's just trash. Like, they got all these voice samples, but I guess they can only pack in three songs? And like, at what cost? Yeah, get your good, get your good headphones for this shit. So hot. <laughs> Holy sh! This is this is the worst shit ever. <laughs> On a scale of crazy bust to Doom 32x, I give the music a cheetah man. It would have been fine to just have sound effects. Silence would have been better. And hey, that's what they did with Dragon Slayer. But I still appreciate the effort. I will say that MK4 is still broken like the other three Game Boy MKs, but it's on the extreme easy side instead of the stupid hard side. So instead of broken difficult AI, I double flawless victory to Shinnok by spamming Sub-Zero's slide kick. It's a goddamn death race to the bottom with MK games on the Game Boy, but MK4 takes the gold. But you know what? They're all winners. Okay, I know it's fun to dunk on the Game Boy ports of Mortal Kombat. I know a lot of people grew up with these games. And from a morbid curiosity standpoint, they're really interesting. But the fact is, they're not that great. And they weren't the only option for portable Mortal Kombat. Released in tandem with the Game Boy ports were the Sega Game Gear ports, which were 
way better. I mean, it's not like they were arcade perfect, but they were competent ports with better sound and animations, plus the added color made them feel more authentic and gory. However, nobody won when it came to portable Mortal Kombat 3. Both the Game Boy and Game Gear ports are bad. However, I actually didn't know that there was an MK3 port for the Game Gear, and that's because it didn't come out in North America. It was only released in the PAL region, and judging by the prices on eBay, I'd say only just barely released. But I'm thankful the gods of gaming and capitalism allowed it to be, because this port is the reason we have the Sega Master System port of Mortal Kombat 3. Yes, you heard me correctly. A port of Mortal Kombat 3, a game released in 1995, was ported to the Master System, a console made in 1985. How? Because Brazil. That's how. Mortal Kombat 3 was released for the Sega Master System in 1996 exclusively in the country of Brazil. If you didn't know, Brazil is not only the land where the Master System beat the NES, it's also the land where the Master System ruled the console gaming space almost exclusively for decades. Meaning, Sega's 8-bit system might be the only console in the world sold for over 30 years straight. But it's not just that Brazil is a bizarro la-la land where Sega magically beat Nintendo for no reason. Brazil, it turns out, has an insane insanely high import tax. For example, when the PS4 launched in Brazil, it apparently retailed for 1,899 US dollars, while it was only 399 in North America. However, the Master System at the time was still only 50 bucks. Sega had a partner company named Tectoy that was able to get around this import tax by manufacturing Master Systems in Brazil, and Nintendo just never caught up. And okay, while we say the Master System is still manufactured there, that's not totally true. These Master Systems today are plug-and-plays, like a Master System Mini, with tons of games on them. Side note, Tectoy also made Genesis's slash Mega Drives in Brazil, but according to former Tectoy CEO Stefano Arnhold, consumers apparently did not understand the difference between 8 and 16-bit and would not pay more for a 16-bit console with fewer built-in games. <laughs> What? So Tectoy had a team that developed Master System games and also handheld conversions from the Game Gear to the Master System way after Sega stopped caring about either system. If you didn't know, a Game Gear is basically just a portable Master System, so this version of Mortal Kombat 3 is extremely similar like you'd expect. There are a couple differences. The perspective is different, you know, pulled back a little more, and the Master System version has music in the stages. It's also not good, like at all. But, if you've got the scratch, it'd be one hell of a cherry in your video game collection. I mean, how many games can you play on both the PlayStation 1 and Sega Master System? One day. One day I will own it. I'll put it next to Greg Hastings' pa paintball sealed. One day. So we've seen some bangers so far, but if you can believe it, Portable Mortal Kombat hadn't quite hit rock bottom just yet. I mean, between mythologies, Sub-Zero, and Special Forces, the series as a whole wasn't doing so hot. But in 2001 came the legendarily terrible Mortal Kombat Advance by VirtuCraft. But don't take my word for it, Ed Boon himself apologized for it. It is the worst reviewed Mortal Kombat game on game rankings, and the all-time third worst Game Boy Advance game on game rankings. I actually don't want to talk too much about this one because Rock Bottom is the first step to real improvement, and Midway would actually start an impressive trend from MK Advance. I'm talking about 2002's Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, developed internally at Midway, which was a really ambitious and solid GBA fighter. It incorporated the 3D graphics from the console versions, and look, some stages even have reflections. Honestly, this game looks really good and plays pretty well. Finally, they were taking the portable ports seriously, and on top of that, it's a competent fighting game. Wait, Prissy Katana? Diva Lee Mei? Anime Scorpion? Anime Sonya? Anime Frost? Yes, to pad out the crypt in the GBA port, different character skins are unlocked here, and for some reason, each character has an anime variant which is actually just a color palette variant. Not really sure what makes this Black Frost or this Blue Scorpion anime, but I'm just happy the words Anime Scorpion exist in a video game. Fighting games in the GBA was actually a pretty crowded space. Street Fighter and Tekken had excellent showings, for example, so I'm not sure I feel comfortable saying that this one's near the top. There's definitely room for improvement. In fact, 
they tried to improve it. Yes, after years of crappy portable Mortal Kombat games, Midway finally dropped a decent one, and they weren't done. Enter 2003's Mortal Kombat Tournament Edition, which, despite the generic name, is an updated version of Deadly Alliance. A different roster, practice and tag team modes, more currency for a deeper crypt experience. I'm not sure why they didn't just expand the roster instead of swapping out fighters. I mean, the roster is bigger, but my girl Frost is gone! Still, it would appear that from here, Midway would start taking portable Mortal Kombat games seriously. The DS would receive Ultimate Mortal Kombat, which, while yet another port of Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, was critically praised for its online capabilities and being a good arcade conversion. Mortal Kombat Unchained is a feature-filled port of Mortal Kombat Deception on the PSP, and the Vita port of Mortal Kombat 9 is a damn fine port of the series' big reboot. This probably would have been my choice for most ambitious Mortal Kombat port, except now we have Mortal Kombat 11 for the Switch. <laughs> Press the A button. A damn fine port in its own right, and also the culmination of Mortal Kombat's entire portable lineage. It's incredibly compromised visually, but plays just as tight as the PS4 version, as near as I can tell. But walking around the crypt in the Switch version gives me the same feeling as playing the Tiger GameCom or Game Boy Color ports. The choice to make so much of the game require an internet connection also does kneecap so much of the appeal of a portable version of this game, to the point where it's fair to ask, well, unless you only own a Switch, what's the point? It's pretty weird, it's very ambitious, and it's nearly completely unnecessary, but it keeps the dream alive, and as far as punching weight's concerned, it's a classic. It's also not the only time we can talk Switch games on punching weight, the Switch it's got more than a few ambitious ports, so if you want us to cover more Switch games, let us know in the comments. Or if you want us to keep wading through the bottomless void of weird Game Boy and DS games, hey, we can do that too. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for watching. We have a Patreon. Uh, please help us out. Every single one of these people, they're awesome, and they have helped us out. Uh, you can be part of the the uh, ex Patreon exclusive podcast, the Patreon exclusive uh, uh, Discord and you get videos early, check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Ring the bell so you can get the damn notifications when you can subscribe, all that stuff. Thanks for watching. See you again real soon. Bye.